Good morning, church. What an amazing service we just had with Sean McDowell. However, I want to get right to the fun of our, our show today. We have Megan Allman with us from Apologetics Inc., Inc. correct? Right. Like Incorporated. Yeah. Like Incorporated. That's one of my favorite <laughs> movies, Monsters, Inc. They need I know. Make a Apologetics, Inc. movie. Well, that's I what watch. I tell people. Like, It's like Monsters, Inc., but Apologetics, Inc. And then <laughs> I think, I don't know, is that really the, yeah. <laughs> the you know, best For some comparison? people, that's just as scary, though. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> It's true. It's true. <laughs> but, but no, that is absolutely wonderful. And Megan, you were with us for the conference, uh, talking through with your husband on stage, which is so fun watching you guys do handstands yeah. getting up there. We did our handstands. Yeah. Yes, we're a little rusty, but we got we got through it. <laughs> that was oh, that was such a joy. I love watching. I got a little scared when the mics popped, but everything worked out. We it were did. all good. It was a cute moment, and I think everybody thought it was awesome. And they were also I, I had like some comments to me like, I don't, how how do they handstand across the stage? How, yeah. Like, I can't do that. I'm that like, was, well, we were both gymnasts. Yeah. So we were both highly competitive gymnasts. We reached kind of the highest levels of the sport back wow. in the day. That was a solid 20 years ago. Yeah. So <laughs> at okay. this point, but some things remain. Now, I do remember, though, running into you and, and Trip, uh, your husband down in Georgia went, went to Summit, mm -hmm. and your kids were like climbing through all the trees. I remember the first time yeah. I saw it, I was like, Everything can be okay. That would be our son for sure. Yep. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And somebody turned to me and they're like, "Oh no, those are the almonds, kids. It, it runs in the family." I was <laughs> it's like, "Just normal, just it's normal. Just normal. That's normal. That's nothing the... to see here." Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised Trip's not up in the tree with them. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, he was busy Perfect. doing other stuff, or he would have yeah. been. Yeah. So with with Apologetics Inc, though, you go around and you speak on a myriad of topics. Yes. One of our most viewed videos on our YouTube channel here at Christ First Church is you speaking on abortion. Yeah. Uh, and and pro-life matters uh, mm -hmm. with our church. Last year, uh, at this point, you spoke with our uh, with our live stream, our pre-show, about the importance of students going off to college and why they walk away from their faith, what causes students to walk away from their faith, and that was an amazing discussion. We've referenced mm -hmm. it a lot. And today, you're coming in kind of talking about beauty and art and... Uh, yeah. How, how that impacts the world around us, the church's involvement with that, cultural involvement with that. And so I'd love to just hear from you uh, and just... Cool. What, yeah. What 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 is why is beauty so important? I guess is really our question. That's a great question. Um, well, I was asked to speak on this for Summit Ministries to our students. Yeah. And so I sat back. They said, "Could you could you do something on beauty?" Yes. To which my response was, "Could." Could you ask a specific question about it? Because beauty is a huge topic. Yeah. And there's so much you can unpack. And then I had the the problem of thinking, how am I going to talk about this to 16-year-old boys? Mm. Right? Like, how, how are they going to receive this? And so yeah. prayerfully, with trepidation, no, I started yeah. wading into the topic and just my whole world opened up. Mm. Um, and when I talked to the students and when I talked to the students here this weekend, uh, I began with a story about a man named Vidran Smilovic, okay. who was a cellist in the Bosnian symphony. Um, yes, during the Bosnian war. So there's actually a fictional yeah. account written about this story called the cellist of Sarajevo. Mm. Um, but this actually happened. So in Sarajevo, which was this beautiful city once upon a time, right? Yeah. It was a, yeah. the Balkan Jerusalem. Um, when the Bosnian War broke out, the Bosnian Serbs, who wanted to establish an independent state, surrounded the city of Sarajevo, which was in a valley. Okay. So they were in the mountains around the city, and they laid siege to the city. It was horrific. So they were firing into the city daily. Mm. Um, we're, you know, we're seeing something like that right now yeah. over in Israel with the conflict back and forth, which is horrific enough. So something like that in Sarajevo mm. for four straight years. Wow. The wow, siege that's lasted. Devastating. It was. Um, of course, you could imagine the death toll and the destruction to that beautiful city. Um, Vidran lived in the city at the time in his apartment, and he uh, actually uh, was witnessed one day in a market square near his apartment. Yeah. A mortar shell was fired into the market square. Wow. And in a moment, it killed 22 innocent people. Uh, they were Ooh. standing in a bread line to buy food. Mm. And so Vidran went, and he responded, and he was trying to clean up and help the wounded and, and all the things that you could imagine would happen in that moment. And um, something in him shifted where he thought, I have to do something. Yeah. Well, the thing that he did was he went and got his cello and he went and sat in the crater in that market square where the explosion had happened and he began to play. 
this incredibly heartbreaking piece. The piece is Adagio in G minor. Okay. Um, and if you listen to it, it has an interesting history of its own, but he went back every day for 22 days and he played that piece, one day for each victim. Wow. And the world looked on as this happened. Mm -hmm. And they're going, what do we do with this? And I think that what it was, is it was Vedran's act of defiance. Yeah. It was his way of declaring war and saying, you know, that you can do what you're doing to my city. Mm -hmm. And you can kill and you can destroy. You cannot touch this. Wow. You can't have it. And um, I think that story tells us, you know, beauty is something we often take for granted in our culture. There are reasons for it. Mm -hmm. uh, consequences of ideas that have come yeah. down to us that it's just in the eye of the beholder or beauty is simply a matter of preference or beauty is simply a luxury or something just for rich people when in actuality it's a vital part of our existence and uh, we need yeah. it for human flourishing yeah no you're, you're absolutely right i think i think sometimes we we incorporate beauty into entertainment right we, we kind of mesh them together like oh beauty is just a part of being entertained yeah and entertainment is something you get when you have time to relax entertainment is something you get when all your other things are taken care of that's that's your bonus that's your dessert if you if you if you can get it right right but you're saying no beauty actually needs to be in incorporated into daily life entirely yeah and not only that it's already there mm -hmm. but we so often don't yeah. notice or pay attention or recognize it yeah. when it's right before us. Um, yeah, I asked the question of the students, do you think our culture is obsessed with beauty? Mm. And their answer is, well, yeah. yeah. And then the next question is, well, what do they mean when they say beauty? Mm. And immediately you get the responses, especially from the young women. They mean the way you look. Yeah, 100%. It's all about you know cosmetics or how your hair is done or your fashion or those types of things. It's all about that and they're right which means that we live in a culture that thinks it's obsessed with beauty, but it's actually taken beauty, like this, yeah. this concept, and it shrunk it so much mm. that we live in a culture that's starving for it. Yeah, because you think about um, architecture too, right? Like if we look at architecture, Absolutely. historically, there, there was a, a period well, for most of history where architecture was beautiful. As they would build things that were even just common use things. You look at um, train station in New York. I uh, can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Gorgeous building, mm -hmm. beautiful building. Grand Central. Grand Central. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. You know, for as close as we are to New York, I don't go too often, and uh, but beautiful building. And yet nowadays, if we were to build a new a new train station, it pro it probably just a concrete square. Oh you know? yeah. It, it would maybe some glass windows, and, and they call it a day. Just efficiency. Let's get from A yeah. to B and do yeah. the thing that's most efficient and productive. And mm -hmm. that's kind of those are the virtues of our culture. Yeah. Yeah, the author, uh, Dr. Kelly Capick, he's a theologian at Covenant College, wrote a book called You Are Only Human. Mm. It's worth a read. It's a theological treatise on finitude, which is basically our limits yeah. as human beings. And he argues that our limits are good things, that God gave us limits as human beings before the fall wow, and yeah. called them good. Um, but we so so, much, so many times try to surpass those limits in our day-to-day -day rush in our mm. lives to do things that really exceed what humans were meant to be able to accomplish in a day because oh, yeah. we're striving for efficiency mm. and productivity. And his argument is those are our culture's highest virtues, but they are not God's highest virtues. Wow. That God's highest virtue is love. That's the greatest commandment. Mm -hmm. Love God, love others. Um, but that love is about the most inefficient thing that a person can do. You, that's logical. I mean, that you're right, right? Like, totally. Love, love, love is not always logical. It's not always efficient. It's not always the easiest thing. But I know it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I think that I would argue that beauty is similar because mm. it requires time. It requires inefficiency. Yeah. It requires appreciation, and that those things are things that slow us down. Yeah. And and even just in the way we look at God's design of the world around us, in the, in the same way. In the same way we could we can see God's value for love and his design and his relationship with us, we can also look around us and see his passion for beauty and his design in beauty. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Wow. When you read The Abolition of Man, which is mm -hmm. not a book about beauty, but okay. it is a book about values, and it's probably my favorite thing that C.S. Lewis wrote, which is saying a lot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, oh, it is good stuff. Oh, all of it. I recommend anything. <laughs> you, know what's a, you know what's a weird one? Sorry, side side tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird one that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but I adore his space trilogy. Oh man. Is is it's like Narnia for adults. It is yes, it is. It's thing. I mean it's even deeper than that. Because mm -hmm. every time you go back to that one, there's yeah. just taps into more about this human question. Yes. 
What yes. does it mean to be human? Um, in the abolition of man, though, there is a scene where Lewis, as a professor, um, he's this is what's happening in the book. He, as a professor, has received a grammar, high school grammar book. Yes. And just as professors often will receive curriculum that's they want to go into circulation, but it's got to get like the the approval mm-hmm. of the the people who are in you know in yes. the institutions. Yeah. So he received this high school grammar book, and he's reading the grammar book. And in this grammar lesson, he comes across the the authors talking about uh, the poet Coleridge mm-hmm. describing a scene at a waterfall where two tourists were looking at the waterfall. Mm. One of the tourists called the waterfall pretty. The other called it sublime, which in definition is very close to what we yep. would talk about with beauty. So we can re- replace sublimity with beauty. Mm. And... Um, the, the the Coleridge in that moment said that the first tourist was actually wrong in his assessment of the waterfall, but the second one got it right. Why was that? The, well, this is the authors of the textbook yeah. said that neither man had it right. They were just talking about their feelings. They weren't talking mm. about the waterfall at all. And this is where Lewis said these men were no longer teaching grammar. They were teaching a worldview and a dangerous one at that. That when we take a value like beauty and reduce it to just our feelings, just in the eye of the beholder, purely something that is subjective, we lose things that are actually woven into the fabric of reality. Wow. And his point in this was, when that man looked at the waterfall, he couldn't have been having beautiful feelings in order to call it beautiful. The only way he was able to call it beautiful was that when he looked at the waterfall, it made him feel small. His wow. feelings were feelings of humility, wow. which meant that the beauty was a real aspect of the waterfall. Wow. Not wow. just in the eye of the beholder, yeah, but so his objective. Then, yes, it's an objective truth that beauty is like, you, you can't take beauty away with words, right? You can't be, you can't just be like, well, this is my opinion about this piece. It's like, no, this piece is, this is beautiful. What God's created here is beautiful. You can call things truly beautiful. Now there's plenty of room for talking about yeah. taste in all of yeah. this. If we recognize that that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, <laughs> And and the there are emotions that beauty begins to spark within us, right? There's moments yeah. of awe, as you you talked about, in that that feeling small. And there's moments of of peace at times, or or, or a joy, or just like a happiness. But but That's right. those those are a they're an element of how we respond to experiencing beauty. Yes, and that's an interesting part of the, yeah, that's an interesting part of the conversation because we can define certain attributes that beautiful things share. Mm. Thomas Aquinas did that. Augustine talked about it. Jonathan Edwards, the theologian, and those are wonderful places to go. Like we know that beautiful things, for example, um, all have this kind of unity of their form and content. They're they're simple in the theological sense in that there's nothing uh, missing Mm. And there's nothing extra about them. They're complete and whole. Um, We know that beautiful things have a sense of proportion and a sense of harmony about them. Like all the parts bring out the best in all the other parts. We know that beauty is the kind of thing you know when you see, Mm -hmm. you recognize. But those definitions can't encapsulate those psychological things. So there's always a little bit of mystery in conversations about beauty among philosophers because of the very thing you were talking about. Mm. And if you notice, Josh, because you're like an aesthetically driven guy, like you, I see all this, the display of this the way this <laughs> church you. looks, Thank like you. you and this team, it's incredible to walk around. There's attention paid to detail, yeah. which yeah. matters. Um, when you encounter true beauty, it doesn't just bring pleasure. It does. It certainly does that. It'll bring peace and pleasure. But sometimes it brings pain. You're right. Sometimes it brings fear. Sometimes you encounter something truly beautiful, and I'll ask the students about this and say, have you ever seen something that was so beautiful you started to tear up and you weren't sure what was happening, and then your friends were kind of like, what's wrong with you Yeah, kind of yeah. thing, but you didn't, you couldn't explain it, and it was almost embarrassing. You get flustered or whatever, and I, I tried to tell those students, nothing's wrong with you. You just got it in that moment. You got it. And that beauty awakens those psychological effects, and as Lewis called it, a type of homesickness. The reason being that if beauty is real, then it has to come from beyond us. His argument was that God is the source, and that's the thing we long for most. It's his argument from desire, right? They're part of it. And he said that that what we want is out there, and it's like we want to revel in it, like jumping into the the great big ocean, like my son did when he was a toddler. (laughs) Like there was no stopping him. Like He had to to bathe in it. Yeah. Um, we want to do that with beauty, but we can't quite get in. And so it awakens this longing within us. No, I love that. We actually have a comment coming in from 
Kareem online watching. He says, that's so interesting. Just as God defines love and objective morality, he defines objective beauty through his creation. Those yes. things that make us feel small were created by God. Brilliant. Yes, yeah, Kareem, do, that's exactly that. it. I do love that. And so as we're having this conversation in God's creation, and we're talking about beauty as, as you're talking about it's almost like an element of its own. It's, it's this kind of un, untraceable-esque, um, we can't just, you know, plug a device into it and be like, this is the result of beauty right here. AI, tell me what it is. Yeah, well, um, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, I think it was the philosopher Gabriel Marcel. He talked about uh, the fact that beauty is one of those big questions that yeah. many philosophers, they devote their lives to these big questions, yeah. like like love, like Kareem brought up, like the meaning of life or what happens when you die. Beauty is one of those that they'll dev devote their whole lives to studying and never reach the end of the question. Yeah. So the reason is that to some degree, we are the question. Mm. We are somewhat a mystery to ourselves and because you and I cannot step outside of ourself and then fully objectify or stick ourselves under a microscope to study like, like a yeah. science object, right? Yeah. Um, we can't do it. And so there's always going to be that little bit of mystery. I'm okay with mystery. Yeah. Mystery leaves room for awe and wonder, and it's not the same thing as a contradiction. No. Mystery just means I don't have all the information yet. Yeah. And in our science-driven world, boy, do we want all the information. My favorite. I was talking to Drew Worsham last night. Yeah. Because he, so Drew Worsham is, he's an illusionist, uh, mentalist who does <laughs> some tricks during the conference. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that during the conference, he had to keep clarifying that what he's doing wasn't real magic. He was just doing yeah. tricks. And I was like, okay, Drew, so what's the story behind you needing to over clarify on this? He's like, dude, we've been getting emails when we go to these conferences yeah. that people are scared I'm doing real witchcraft <laughs> yeah. during this apologetics conference. And, and on one hand, it probably feels pretty good on his end to be like, I'm tricking them so good. He will. He'll right? say that's like the highest compliment the highest for a magician. But, <laughs> but at the same time, there is that element where it's like, hey, guys, it's okay to not know how he's doing this. Yeah. It's okay to not understand how he's pulling the trick off, how he's hiding the thing, how he's tr like getting this past you without you noticing it. We don't have to necessarily just be like, oh, that's, that's bad, right? Yeah, we want to figure everything out. Mm -hmm. Chesterton talked about that in Orthodoxy. There's where wonder. He, he said, exactly, exactly. It's mm -hmm. wonder. And when we try to figure everything out, we strip all of the not Harry Potter variety yes. magic mm -hmm. out of the God-soaked universe that we live in. Yeah. And we make that universe entirely too small. Oh, We're absolutely. supposed to be drawn to wonder and awe because he's the source. Yes. Have you ever been to Disneyland or Disney World? Absolutely. Okay. So in Disney World, I love the Haunted Mansion, which is this like cute ride. But you walk up and you have this building there. And you're yeah. like, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a decently sized building, but it's not that big. And you go inside and all of a sudden you're in this ride that's like huge. It's And there's a wonder to those rides where you walk into what appears to be a small building. And all of a sudden, it's this massive, massive, massive ride. And you're like, I, I, this should be over by now. Where, How are we still where going? Where did they put it all? Where did they put it all? And they, <laughs> they've mastered hiding it. And it creates a wonder and amusement in their parks. Yeah. Walt Disney yeah. World is like walking through the imagination of Walt Disney. Yes. Which is yes. an incredible experience. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. Uh, well, and, when we were speaking to students on this topic, the thing that we can bring it back to mm -hmm. is the fact that every single one of us has a creative capacity. Like we could have a whole conversation about yeah. art um, and, and artists, and that's a huge part of this because yeah. we need to love our artists well and pay attention to them. And mm -hmm. really, they tell us a lot about the ideas of the culture because they're sen sensitive, yeah. like canaries, right, yep, yep. to the culture. Um, but each of us has a creative capacity that was granted us by God and part of our like role as human beings is to learn what that capacity is so that we can cultivate beauty mm -hmm. in the world around us, whether it's through art or even in like lesser ways, through bringing um, order to chaos or yeah. organization yeah. to messy spaces or it, just like the team last night did and, and contributing their time to bring the church and bring it yes. ready for today's Absolutely. service. Um, Absolutely. Little things like that actually have eternal significance because mm -hmm. it's a way to contribute beauty to the world. And in that way, when we understand who we are as Christ followers, yeah. we understand what the true source is, those things are not meaningless. Yeah. They're not just trivial, mundane, everyday tasks. They're actually our acts of yeah. defiance. Megan, 
Thank you so much. Yeah. We re- I wish we had more time to keep going. But church, if you want to learn more about what Megan's doing, <laughs> Apologetics Inc. It's apologetics.org. Super easy. Apologetics.org. You also work alongside your husband trip with Summit Ministry, something we Summit. encourage Dot org. all of our <laughs> students to be a part of at some point. It's an amazing, amazing opportunity. Yeah. And now it is time, church, for us to worship and study the word. God. we got Sean McDowell coming up shortly. So thank you so much. And I'll see you next week.